We're starting a new study here. You have the book of Ezekiel before you. We're going to look at chapter 1, and let's begin reading together here in Ezekiel chapter 1. I'll read verses 1 through 3. Hopefully, we're going to be able to go through the entire book this, uh, <laughs> this year. No, I don't think so. We'll be looking through the first chapter um, tonight, and we'll begin by looking at verses 1 through 3. I'll read verses 1 through 3 here in Ezekiel chapter 1, and we'll begin our study. Ezekiel chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 3. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kevar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kevar. And the hand of the Lord was upon him there. Now, when we begin here, I'm going to give you some background. It's going to take a few minutes so that we can understand this book, at least some of the basics of the book of Ezekiel, so that when we get into it, we'll be able to, to understand some of the things that are, are being written here. The first chapter, I must confess, is a very, very difficult chapter as a way of introduction. I, I'm just going to present it to you that way. And uh, one of the commentators that I used in my, my preparation of this particular study was saying that the first chapter has a tendency of discouraging people from reading through the rest of the book because it is a very difficult chapter. And, and uh, I would be encouraging you as we go through the book of Ezekiel together that you be reading the chapter that we'll be looking at that night. Be prepared for it so that as you're reading along with me, you can start formulating questions and prayerfully as we go through it, perhaps some answers will be given to you as you read the book of Ezekiel. But this is one of those books that is very difficult to study and to get a good knowledge of. We know that there's nothing known of Ezekiel beyond what is found here in this particular book. He's not mentioned in any other Old Testament books. He is not mentioned directly in the New Testament. And yet, some of the imagery that will be seen here in Ezekiel is also found in the book of Revelation. We know, according to verse 3, that he's a priest, and we know who his father's name is. His father's name is Buzzy. Now, you don't know the name Buzzy, but later on, he became famous for a style of haircut. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just felt like saying that. The buzz cut. But he was the son of a priest. He was a priest himself. Now, if verse 1 refers to his age, then he has to be around 30 years of age when he begins his ministry. Now, that would be significant from this perspective. According to the book of Numbers, chapter 4, verse 23, the priest would begin his duties at the age of 30. And so commentators uh, commonly believe that when he says in verse 1, it came to pass in the 30th year that he's speaking concerning his own age. Now, his name is Ezekiel. The word Ezekiel means God will strengthen. And as we go through the book, you're going to see that he goes through a variety of things that gives us insight into why his name is Ezekiel. It's going to clarify the meaning of his name. You're going to see in chapter 3 that he, he will shut himself up in his house and will be bound, will become mute. You'll see that he's going to be ordered to lay on his right side and then on his left side for a total of 430 days in chapter 4. He's going to be eating bread that is baked with fuel made from human waste in chapter 4, verse 12. He shaves his head and his beard in chapter 5. He's not allowed to mourn at the death of his wife in chapter 24. And in chapter 24, he loses his speech. He goes through a variety of things that we'll be looking at as we study the book. But you'll see why his name, Ezekiel, was, was given to him. It simply means God will strengthen so God is going to use Ezekiel as a sign. God is going to use Ezekiel as a sign to the nation of Israel by the things that Ezekiel endures. Now, in context, so that we have a background, we know that the nation of Babylon invaded uh, the, the, uh, the nation of Judah and enacted a series of three deportations. You see that in the Old Testament. You see that in the year 605, the year 597, and the year 586 B.C., that uh, the king of Babylon came against the, the nation of Judah and took them captive. 
In verse 2, we see here that Ezekiel says that he was taken to Babylon in what we would know as the second deportation, which took place in 597 and is recorded in 2 Kings chapter 24. We know that he's living in an area there by what is called the, the River Kabar, which was actually a canal called a royal canal right off of the Euphrates River. Now, what's going on right now in the nation is a time of great sorrow. The Jewish people have been taken captive, and their hearts are broken by it. As a matter of fact, there's a beautiful psalm because it speaks concerning the mourning over their deportation and the sorrow that they're suffering. This beautiful psalm, Psalm 137, gives us insight into what was taking place. It says in Psalm 137, verses 1 through 4, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yes, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there, those who carried us away captive asked of us a song. Those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? And so they're going through this time of great mourning and great sorrow as the Lord begins to work. During this time, God raises up three prophets. After Babylon had invaded and depart, deported the Jews, Jeremiah was raised up, Daniel was raised up, and Ezekiel was raised up to prophesy during the time of their captivity. Jeremiah ministered to the Jews in Jerusalem, Daniel ministered in the courts of Babylon, Ezekiel ministered to the Jews who were taken captive in Babylon. Now, his ministry can be summed up with this. He was most concerned with the glory of the Lord. We know that when Moses communed with God on Mount Sinai, from that point on, Moses was marked for life. We know that Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord and his ministry became centered on the holiness of God. We know that when Paul saw Jesus while on the road to Damascus, he became willing to suffer the loss of all things. We know that when John was exiled on Patmos, when he saw what God was going to do, he remained steadfast. But Ezekiel sees the glory of God. And as he sees the glory of God, his ministry never strays from that, that, that sense of wanting to declare the greatness and the glory of God who covers our sins. Now, this book is going to cover a certain period of time. For those who take notes, it covers from 592 uh, to 570, around 570 B.C. And so, as we look at this particular book here, we're going to be seeing some dramatic and powerful things. Now, let's begin reading again at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 and 2. We'll get into our study. It came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kibar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, which was in the, ninth, in the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity, verse 3, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kabar, and the hand of the Lord was upon him. Ezekiel is giving to us information concerning his calling. He gives us the precise date. For those who take notes, the date is, uh, is uh, July 31st, 593 B.C., he knows precisely that the day the Lord called him into his prophetic ministry. He knows the day and even gives it for us. I find it significant that, that you might be able to, not all people can, but I find it significant that you can actually, some people in this church, I can do this, can actually pinpoint the day that the Lord called them. I can tell you it was December 27, 1970. That's the day that I gave my heart to the Lord. And Ezekiel gives to us that insight. And what he's saying here, simply put, is this. He says, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. Now, it's interesting in verse 3 how he says, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest. That's what you call the calling. He's receiving his calling here. As a matter of fact, chapter 1, I chose to entitle it simply the calling of Ezekiel because that's what he's talking about right now. He's, call he's talking about his calling. It's the time when the word of the Lord came to him. It's, it's similar to other prophets. You see, for example, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4, now the prophet Jeremiah said, uh, then the word of the Lord came to me. The prophet Hosea in chapter 1, verse 1 said, the word of the Lord came to Hosea. In Joel, in chapter 1, verse 1, it says, the word of the Lord came to Joel. And so that's what's happening here. God is calling him into the prophetic ministry. He's by this royal canal called the, the River Kebar. And as God is calling him, notice it says, there the hand of the Lord was upon him. So the word of the Lord speaks concerning his calling, but the hand of the Lord speaks of how God grabbed hold of him and anointed him, how God empowered him, 
how God began to work through him. The hand of the Lord is a way of speaking how God grabbed hold and empowered this man's life. In Acts 11, 21, it says, the hand of the Lord was with him. A great number believed and turned to the Lord. So this speaks about a personal and powerful experience that is beyond imagination and it's beyond hallucination. Some might be saying he had this incredible hallucination or he imagined this. He's saying it's not that at all. He's saying God spoke to me and God empowered me. See, God's calling and God's empowering is a very important aspect of all ministry. God's calling always will have God's power accompanying it. When God calls you to minister, God empowers you to minister. God never calls you to do something that isn't possible to be done. He will reveal to you your inability to do it. He will reveal to you that you don't have the strength, you don't have the genius, you don't have the cunning ingenuity, the eloquence or ability in your own strength. And you may even hesitate to receive that calling, even as when God was speaking to Moses and, and, and Moses said, I am slow of speech, I, I can't do this. Or when he was speaking to Jeremiah and Jeremiah said, I am but a youth. Or when he was speaking to Isaiah and Isaiah uh, knew that he was a, a man of unclean lips who dwelt amongst the people of unclean lips. One of the things that you'll encounter when God is calling you into service, into ministry, is your own inability. That's one of the very first things that you become aware of. I don't have the capacity to do what I'm being called to do. I don't have that ability. I don't have those degrees. I don't have that eloquence. I don't have that intelligence. I don't have that strength. That's just not me. It's not something I possess. When God calls you, when the Word of the Lord calls you, God's hand is also upon you. And you need to know that. Sometimes when people come to churches like this and so many others like this, they come and they say, well, it's always been this way. They don't understand that this church really sprang out of a home Bible study that was started in Norwalk back in 1973. And they don't understand that, that I, as the pastor of this church, actually taught home Bible studies for something like six or seven years before I even had the ability to begin teaching in churches. And that the Bible studies never grew larger at the maximum of 15 or 20 people. And for years, I, I taught sometimes twice a week like three or four or five people. For years, not for a week, not for a month, but for a year and a year and another year and another year and another year and another year, just always trying to remain faithful to that which God gave. And so sometimes people have a mistaken understanding. They'll say, well, yes, it's easy to minister. You have this large building and a great number of people that come to Bible studies, but they don't realize that, that it's, it's been the hand of the Lord. It's always going to be the hand of the Lord. And it's an awakening of your inadequacy, your inability constantly, and your need for His empowering so that the glory may be uh, to God, given to God, and, and not given to the man. And that's how it works. We have this, this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of power may be of God and not ourselves, Paul says, and that's the way it truly is. You see, so Ezekiel is a man. He's a priest. He's the son of a priest. But he tells us, I was 30 years old when God spoke to me. The word of the Lord came to me, and God's hand of power was upon me. It was true in the Old Testament. It's true in the New when Jesus called his 12 disciples and was going to send them out, Matthew tells us in chapter 10, verse 1, that he had called his 12 disciples to him and he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. So he called his 12 disciples and he gave them power. And then in chapter 10 of Matthew, verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out. He calls you, he empowers you, and He sends you. And that's how it works. God calls you, God empowers you, and then God sends you out. In Acts, in the New Testament, chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. He said, you're going to receive power and you are going to go out and be witnesses. You're going to do witnessing in that you have a gospel message that you present to people. We walk to people and share with them, or here in the Bible study, we will mention that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. We will say the gospel message. 
that Jesus Christ died on a cross for you, that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, took upon himself human flesh, dwelt amongst men, ministered at the age of 33, was taken, was crucified, died, was buried. We, we preach that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead, that he ascended into heaven, and that he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell those who by faith would receive him, those who would hear that message and recognize that this gospel message, this good news of God loving man and doing something about our sin by taking our place and actually receiving the penalty that was due to us. We have partaken in that, and like Paul says, that which we have received, that we delivered unto you. And so that's what happens, but we may know of that message, but it requires the hand of the Lord to be upon us. It, it requires the word of the Lord to come to us in the sense of us hearing what God is saying and God awakening us to his call in our life and then empowering us to take this word out and share it with the needy world. And that's how it works. And so Ezekiel is speaking concerning the fact that God called him as a prophet to the nation, and that's what he's about to do. Now, as this is taking place, verse 4, then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it and radiating out of its midst like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Also from within it came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces and each one had four wings. Their legs were straight. The soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. The hands of a man were under their wings on their four sides, and each of the four had faces and wings. Their wings touched one another. The creatures did not turn when they went, but each one went straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man, each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side, each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and each of the four had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces. Their wings stretched upward. Two wings of each one touched one another, and two covered their bodies. And each one went straight forward. They went wherever the Spirit wanted to go, and they did not turn when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning. And the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning. I don't have a clue what they're talking about. <laughs> but I'll pretend I do. You know, here in verse 4, this is a picture of God's wrath. Notice how it's put. I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north. This is a picture of God's wrath, quite obviously. You see, wind and cloud and fire are all images of God bringing forth His glory as it's going to be revealed in judgment. We know that by simply uh, cross-referencing in Psalm 18, verses 8 through 13, for example, smoke went up from His nostrils and devouring fire from His mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, his thick clouds passed with hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. This is a picture of the glory of God. It's also a picture of, uh, of judgment that's to come. What you have here is a picture of a tremendous thunderstorm, and you see it from the distance as it's approaching. And this cloud is darkening the sky with flashes of lightning. He speaks about amber. That word amber there is shining metal. It's perhaps bronze. And, and what it's revealing is the Lord's glory and God's splendor. He's speaking about judgment that's approaching, and it's approaching from the north. So we know that this is speaking concerning another invasion by the uh, nation of Babylon, which came from 
the north and entered in. Now, in verses 5 and 6, he speaks of the likeness of these four living creatures. Now, when it speaks of the four living creatures, that may represent the four corners of the earth because that would give to us a picture of the sovereignty of God over all things. But who are these four living creatures? Well, these are angels. They're also referred to as cherubim. You see, later on in Ezekiel, in chapter 10, verse 15, we read the cherubim were lifted up. This was the living creature I saw by the river Kibar. So we know that these are what are called cherubim. And this is really a picture of something like a moving throne with the four living creatures who are connected and moving forward. Now, when you read concerning cherubim, I'm not going to give you a great big study on angels and all, but uh, when you read about cherubim, um, the singular is cherub, the plural is cherubim. That's speaking of uh, more than one, obviously. The cherubim are high-ranking angels. There is a, there is a, a structure in, in God's kingdom. Even in the kingdom of darkness, there's a structure. When Paul was writing concerning this structure in Ephesians in chapter 6, if you take notes, it's found in verse 12, he had said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. He was speaking concerning the echelons of angelic hosts. You know, sometimes you may be thinking of, of demons and all, and you don't realize that Satan himself has kind of what we would refer to as like an organizational governmental structure. And principalities are speaking of the highest echelon. It's like in the army you have your generals and you can go on down, into the, down to the enlisted men, the privates, and that's what you have. Principalities are chief rulers. Powers are, are those who have uh, spiritual authority. The rulers are, are those who are world rulers, those angels who interfere with the, the working of kingdoms and, and, and politics and all. And then you have the spiritual hosts, which are general demonic hordes. And, and so you know that there are structures in, in, the, in the demonic kingdom, if you will, and there is structure in God's kingdom. You, you will see angels mentioned. You have Michael and and, and Gabriel, who are referred to as archangels. You have the cherubim, who, who have a special duty of, of being there, guarding the holiness of God. You have the seraphim, who are mentioned in the book of Isaiah, and these are high-ranking angels. And the cherubim are the ones that are spoken of here. They have a, a, a certain function. They're entrusted with upholding the glory of God. And, and whenever you see a cherub, whenever you see the cherubim, when you're studying your Bible and you see cherub, you will see that they are related to the holiness of God. And so he's speaking concerning angels here. But notice with me in verse 5, he says, they had the likeness of a man. And we will look at that in just a moment. Now, he goes on and he says, their legs, verse 7, were straight. The soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. They, they sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. The hands of a man were under their wings on their four sides, and each, had, each of the four had faces and wings. Their wings touched one another. Creatures, the creatures didn't turn when they went. Each one went straight forward. And so he speaks concerning, verse 7, their legs being straight. That simply means their, their legs don't bend at the knees. They're ready to go in any direction. Uh, there's discussion concerning why did he describe their feet like calves' feet? Some say because of, a, of a speediness. Others speak concerning of stability. When he says in verses 8 and 9, the hands of a man were under their wings and their four sides, and they had four faces. Uh, the hands of a man is a picture of readiness to serve. The wings that extend and touch is a picture of perfect unity in action. They have a unity because they're there uh, to do that which God has called them to do. Even demonic angels have a unity when it comes to trying to destroy. And God's uh, angels have a stability, and they want to do those things that bring glory to God. Unity in the kingdom of God is an extremely important aspect. In the angelic world, unity is what gets things done. It's, it's how a task is accomplished. It's, it's how things are actually ordered and structured so that something good can happen. That's what unity does. Jesus himself said that every house that is divided against itself will fall. He said any kingdom that's divided against itself is, is doomed to failure. It's going to fall. And so there's a principle of unity. And, and in the body of Christ, there is the spirit of unity that we're to endeavor to keep. We're to keep the spirit of peace and unity together. And that's something that we work to have. 
We want to maintain this relationship. Why? Because God can use us to go out and take his word to, to reach the world. And you have a picture here of angelic unity here. They're there to do what God has commanded and directed them to do. Now, notice in verse 10 how it says, as for the likeness of their faces, they were very ugly. No, he didn't say that. I'm just thinking that. As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man, they had the face of a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Now, they had the face of a man. Man is God's premier creation. Remember that. Man is God's crowning creation. When God chose to bring redemption, he did not take the form of an animal. He took upon himself human flesh. Man is not an evolved animal. And so man is regarded in Scripture as being God's high creation. Man represents intelligence. And so you have man. You have a lion. A lion stands for majesty and power. You have an ox. The ox represents service and strength. And you have the eagle that represents swiftness. An eagle flies and soars over all things. Now, it's interesting because the early church fathers, when they were beginning to look at this book, also understood that they, the images here correspond to the four Gospels. Whenever you read your Gospels, each one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each one of those Gospels had a purpose in its writing. Matthew was written specifically for Jewish readers. When you read the Gospel of Matthew, you'll notice this, and perhaps you already know this, but when you read the Gospel of Matthew, you're going to see that Matthew quotes from the Old Testament prophets quite often. Because what Matthew is doing is he was writing to Jewish readers and he wanted to demonstrate to them that Jesus Christ is Messiah. When you read the Gospel of Mark, Mark was written for Romans. It was written specifically for Roman people and therefore what he wanted to do is he wanted to speak to them and wanted to teach them that Jesus Christ was a servant. When you look at the Gospel of Luke, the Luke's, uh, Luke's gospel was appealing to the Gentiles, especially to the Greeks, because the Greeks had a picture of the perfect or ideal man. And so they wanted Jesus Christ to be presented. Luke wanted Jesus presented as the perfect man, the ideal man. And then when you read the gospel of John, John specifically is dealing with the deity of Christ. I mean, read the very first verse of John, and you'll see what I'm talking about. In the beginning... Uh, we, it was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that's how he begins. He doesn't even have an introduction. When you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all have introductions. But when you get into the Gospel of John, you start with a declaration that Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. That's how he begins. And each one of them had an ancient designation. And so they would use as an image, and you can still see this in some Bibles. They actually, if you open up the Gospel of Matthew, you're going to see a lion there. Because the lion represents the, the, the lion of the, of, of the tribe of Judah. Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And they'll have an image of an ox for the gospel of Mark because Jesus is regarded as a servant because the Romans looked at the highest, um, the thing that they esteemed most high was the one who was a servant of Rome. And therefore, Jesus is portrayed there symbolically as an ox. And when you look into the gospel of Luke, they'll have a picture of a man there uh, because of his incarnation. And then when you get into the gospel, of John, the picture is an eagle representing his deity because the eagle soars above all things and, and, and had a re was regal. And that's what he's picturing here is a picture of Jesus Christ. It's a picture really of, of the image of God and how God truly is and he will choose to be incarnated. Now, in verse 12, it says, each one went straight forward. They went wherever the Spirit wanted to go and they did not turn when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning, and the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning. So they would go forward as they are directed. No deviation in their direction. They simply go straight ahead. 
Their appearance, as is described in verse 13, communicates God's glory and the fiery justice that they're there to help carry out. And so this is a picture of what is taking place here at that time. Now, in verse 15, as I looked at the living creatures, behold, a wheel was on the earth beside each living creature with its four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their workings was like the color of beryl, and all four had the same likeness. The appearance of their workings was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they moved, they went toward any one of four directions. They did not turn aside when they went. As for their rims, they were so high, they were awesome, and their rims were full of eyes all around the four of them. When the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Wherever the Spirit wanted to go, they went, because there the Spirit went, and the wheels were lifted together with them, for the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went, these went. When those stood still, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up together with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. The likeness of the firmament above the heads of the living creatures was like the color of an awesome crystal stretched out over their head. And under the firmament, their wings spread out straight, one toward another. Each one had two which covered one side, and each one had two which covered the other side of the body. When they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of many waters, like the voice of the Almighty, a tumult like the noise of an army. And when they stood still, they let down their wings. A voice came from above the firmament that was over their heads. Wherever they stood, they let down their wings. Can you imagine if you were trying to declare and describe something as glorious as what Ezekiel is describing? How difficult would that be? And, and it is difficult as we look at this. What we have here, according to many commentators, including one by the name of Charles Feinberg, what you have here is, is, is what is referred to as the vision of the chariot. As you look at the wheels, the wheels represent motion, and it's a picture of irresistible progress. And, and what that would be a picture of is God's impending judgment. God is bringing judgment on the nation, and there's no stopping it. It's interesting how in verse 16 it speaks of the appearance of the, of the wheels and their workings and, and describes it. It's like the color of beryl. And so what you have, according to verse 18, is an enormous wheel that's kind of like connecting heaven and earth. And he's, he's picturing God's judgment that is going to bring about God's purposes. The wheel within the wheel reveals that God moves orderly and progressively. It says in verse 17, when they moved, they went toward any one of four directions. So the judgment machine is moving where the angels go, and it doesn't deviate, it's for sure. Verse 18 speaks of the rims. These are awesome. They're full of eyes. That's a picture of God's perfect knowledge. God sees everything. Everything is open to God, everything. I think that sometimes we, we don't realize that God sees everything. I, I think there are times that I'm glad that He sees everything, and there have been many times that I forget that He sees everything, and there have been some times that I wish that He didn't see everything. Sometimes we can be like children, though we can act as if we think that God doesn't see everything, and, and therefore we start doing things that we ought not to do, thinking that we're getting away with them and failing to realize that God does see all things. And that's what's being spoken up here in verse 18 when it says the rims were full of eyes. It's just another way of speaking of the word omniscience, that, that, that God sees all and knows all. And, and, and that's what the Scripture teaches. In Proverbs 15, verse 3, it says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. God sees it all, and sometimes we forget. Sometimes we think we can get away with things, and we can't because he sees through us. My son David, uh, when he was just a little guy, um, he used to love ice cream. And, um, and, and I can still remember on, on one occasion in particular how that, uh, when, whenever he got quiet, I, I knew something was up. You know that any parent knows that when when it gets quiet in the other room where the kids are playing and it gets quiet, you know something's up. And, and there were times when, when it would get quiet and I know that David was, was doing something. And, and I can still remember on one particular occasion, uh, I was in my room and, and it got quiet. And so I had said, uh, David, where are you? 
And, and, you know, it takes a moment for him to respond, and then you know, I'm over here, and he was just a little guy. He was in probably around three years old, maybe four. He wasn't that old at that time. I'm here, and I'd say, where are you, son? I'm here, you know, and so I thought, okay, he's up to something. And I do remember come walking from my room into the front room, and as I was looking around in the front room, I couldn't see him, so I said to him, where are you? And he was actually behind the, the sofa by one of the arms. They're hiding in a corner. He was, he was behind. The, and so I came, I said, where are you? He said, I'm over here. And I came walking around, and I looked down, and he's, and he's looking up at me, and he's got chocolate on his mouth, you know. And, and I remember looking down at him, and I said to him, David, um, were you in the ice cream? And he goes, no, and, and he's got this, he's got chocolate on his face. There were times when my kids would be doing something and, and they didn't know my eyes were on them. I was watching them. I went watching them do what they're doing. And then you ask them, you bust them, you say, you know, and I learned not to say, were you, because they'd lie. You know, they get that from their mom. But as I was talking to them, I'd say, I'd say, were you? No, no, I wasn't doing that. No, were you? Then I finally have to say, yes, you were. I saw you. I was watching you. You know that the Lord taught me a long time ago, I do the same thing to him. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere. They run to and fro throughout the earth. And the Scripture tells us that God has all knowledge. And, and the wisest thing for me to do is simply agree with him when he busts me, uh, to agree with him when the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes upon my life, to realize that I cannot hide anything from him. And that's what Ezekiel's pointing out. He said, this wheel, this enormous wheel connecting heaven and earth is a picture of the omniscience of God, that God sees all things. Proverbs 5.21 says, The ways of men are before the eyes of the Lord. He ponders all his paths. God watches us and watches what we do. Now, that's not something that ought to scare us, by the way. On the one hand, it ought to humble us. On the other hand, it ought to cause us to be aware of the fact that God is watching over us. But you know, I've discovered something, and so have you. If you've got a niece, a nephew, if you've got a, a baby of your own, a grandchild, I've discovered something. I've even discovered that as, as a married man. I've discovered it in my relationship with my wife. There are times that I catch myself just watching them, just watching them. No judgment. No, I hope they're not up to, you know, no good. Nothing like that. Just watching them. Just watching them. Enjoying them. My, my grandson Josiah, when he plays, he was playing soccer. It's not really playing soccer. They're out there just running around in circles for, you know, several minutes. And then playing t-ball, you know. Mike tells me that when his son Mike, who's 24 years old now, but when Mike, whom we used to call Mikey, Mikey was learning to play t-ball. I remember how, you know, he got up and hit the ball off of that little, you know, little stand that they have, and, and they yelled, run, Mikey, run, run to first, and Mikey ran to first base. And, you know, the kids threw the ball, and nobody can catch the ball when you're five years old, so it goes rolling away. They say, run, run, so he's supposed to run to second. You know what Mikey did? He ran out into center field. And he started running around the center fielder. I mean, that's what he was doing, you know. And, and nobody was getting all uptight at Mikey, you know. You have to come over here, that little thing there. That's, you're supposed to be on second base, Mikey. They had to teach him the rules of the game. But it's something I still laugh about years later because that's a cute thought, you know. And Mike saw that. His eyes were on Mikey. He wasn't there judging him. He was there watching his son and just laughing and enjoying him as he was having fun at play. And I suspect that the Lord's eyes are upon us not simply to judge, judge us and not to catch us doing something wrong. He doesn't need to, to look to catch us. He's already aware of what we're doing. He looks at us because he loves us and he watches us because he cares for us. Just the way, I think, in many ways that you might look at your wife whom you love, your husband whom you love, your children whom you love, your grandchildren, whomever, and you watch them and your eyes are on them and they can't be removed. I just, there are times that I just have my eyes on them just in that, that, that moment of just loving them with all that's within me. And, and God's eyes are upon us. He does watch us. And, and Ezekiel is pointing that out. But Ezekiel is also pointing out the fact that God is bringing judgment and his eyes see all. And as he does so, he can. Because he sees all, he judges fairly because he knows all. And th so the Lord is watching, and that's the picture that we have with this particular wheel. Now, 
The whole picture here in verses 19 through 25 is that they are under the control of the Spirit. And as they're moving, notice verses 24 and 25, it says, As they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of many waters, like the voice of the Almighty, a tumult like the noise of an army. And when they stood still, they let down their wings. A voice came from above the firmament that was over their heads. Whenever they stood still, they let down their wings. They're just standing there in reverence as they await the commands of the Lord. Verse 26, And above the firmament over their heads was the likeness of a throne in appearance like a sapphire stone. And the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. Also, from the appearance of his waist and upward I saw, as it were, the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around, like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. So was the appearance of the brightness all around. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice of one speaking. Ezekiel sees the throne. He sees the throne of God, the throne of God in heaven. The psalmist says the Lord has established his throne in heaven. His kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you hosts, you ministers of his, who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So God has established his throne in heaven, and this is what he sees. And as he's seeing this throne of God, notice he sees the likeness of a man. Now, obviously, this would be Messiah. It's, it's what has been called a prophetic prelude to the incarnation. Because Jesus Christ, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 points that out. And so this is a picture of the Messiah as he is seeing this image and he's seeing that, that the Lord Jesus Christ is there on the throne. And notice in verse 28, it says, it says like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. Now, what you have here is you have a combination of two things. One is you have a rainbow. A rainbow is found in, in Genesis chapter 9, verses 13 through 16. The rainbow, when God places it in the clouds, it was a symbol that he would not destroy the earth once again with a flood. Every time you go after rain and you see a rainbow, that's God's reminder of mercy and grace. The rainbow in the, in the Old Testament is a symbol of the grace of God. In Genesis 9, 13, I set my rainbow in the cloud. It shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God is saying, I will not flood the earth again. And every time you see that rainbow, it's a reminder of my grace towards you. God's grace is abundant towards us. We walk in grace, we stand in grace, we minister by the grace of God, and we're saved by the grace of God. It's all grace. The word grace speaks of God's undeserved or unmerited favor. God gives to us his unmerited favor. When he gives to us mercy, he is withholding from us that which we deserve. When he gives us grace, he's giving to us that which we do not deserve. And so here you have a picture in this rainbow of the grace of God. And it gives to us the insight into the glory of God because God's glory is in his grace. But you also see the power of God. And so you have the majesty of God and the power of God revealed through his grace. And when you encounter the power and the majesty of God, that's what brings you to a place of worship. You see, sometimes when we're singing songs to the Lord, sometimes we think that the songs are for us and for our entertainment. Sometimes we think that the music that we're singing 
has to be to our liking because, after all, I like music, and if the music isn't to my liking, then I just don't want to sing it. There was a time in my life as a young believer that I preferred hearing a Bible study over singing, and the church that I was attending at that time really didn't have the kind of singing that I liked. They had a choir and various other things that I really wasn't into. And so I actually would come, and I knew exactly how long the choir would sing, and I would come when I knew the choir was done. And I would come in, and I would sit at the back of the church, and I'd get the word, and there'd be an invitation. People would get saved, and, and I was real excited about that, and it took a long time for the Lord to teach me that worship isn't about me, that it isn't about what I like. That worship is for Him. And when you draw close to the Lord and when you begin to have a picture of His power and when you begin to have an idea of His majesty and when you begin to enjoy His grace and those things become real in your life, and then you're going to do what He did because He says, when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of God speaking. In other words, when I saw the glory of God, the best thing that I could do is simply hide myself from it in a sense and, and, and lay down before Him and worship Him. This magnificence of this time where God has called me and empowered me and He's about to send me out when He starts showing me his glory and awakens me to the reality of these, the cherubim that are there to guard and protect his holiness, the, the cherubim who are there who are, are moving at his command and by his spirit's direction, the cherubim who up, uphold the glory and holiness of God. When I saw this and when I saw heaven in a sense and I saw the throne there and I saw the man there and it has to be Jesus pre-incarnate, when I see this, it causes me to fall on my face before God and it causes me to worship him. And that's what God has called us to do, guys, to fall on our face, even if it's within our heart as we do so, to worship Him. You see, because you bow your knee to God, not simply by getting down on your knee. You bow your knee to God first in your heart. That's where it begins. Your worship is not an outward action only. It's an inward action that leads to an outer display of what's going on on the inside. And when Ezekiel was there, and he sees this incredible glory, and he gets a glimpse of the pre-incarnate Christ, and he sees all the, the beauty that is beyond description, colors that I'm sure are so much clearer than anything we know, sounds that are so undistorted. When he hears the majestic voice that to him, the best thing he can say is it sounds like many waters. It sounds like a waterfall, just the, the sound of overpowering, the vibration of it as, as, it, as I hear this. All that he's going through sen with his senses causes him to do one thing, and that is to worship God. And, and that's really what we're all about as, as believers, guys. Guys, you know, one of the things that I've, I've said and I believe is if we don't want to worship the Lord here, then heaven really isn't a place for us because that's what you do in heaven. For, for those who don't want to worship God, there's another place waiting for them. But for us, I, I, I want to learn, don't you? I, I want to learn to worship God. I, I want to, to have a sense of His holiness and his power and his majesty and his glory. And, and I want to experience things that will deepen my walk. But at the same time, I'm aware of the fact that when the Apostle Paul had a vision of heaven, he also received a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. So I know that with, with the request and with the answer, there's a cost. And I think that sometimes people know that, that there is a cost, that God will keep you humble because of the excellence of the things he wants to reveal to you. And when we start saying things like this to God, when we start saying, God, I want to have a heart like yours, we need to remember that his heart is broken over sin, and we need to remember that Jesus Christ, whom we say, make me like you, Lord, make me like you, when we sing, that Jesus himself was the wounded healer. He was acquainted with grief. He knew that what suffering was. He knew what rejection was. But he entrusted himself to the one who could save. He entrusted himself to his Father. And so over the years, as I've been asking the Lord to reveal more of himself to me, 
I've done so with the knowledge that as you receive from the Lord, He also keeps you in a place that you will not be puffed up with pride, that He keeps you in the place of humility so that He can continue to use you so that you don't take the glory away from Him. Ezekiel is somebody who's going to live up to his name because he sees great things, but he's also going to pay a great cost. And we'll be seeing that as we go through this book together.